Good morning. Well, the mic, I can hear, it works. Um, welcome to the fourth day of the 2013 Water and Health Conference. My name is Pete Kolsky, and I'm the Associate Director for Teaching and Learning at the Water Institute. And it's my pleasure to be the master of ceremonies for this panel discussion, debating the question or discussing the question, is aid part of the solution? I'm excited to be here with all of you this morning to hear this discussion because about a year ago I bought this thick book that's called Does Foreign Aid Really Work? And because I've put something like 35 years of my life uh, in, or I've been paid for 35 years to work on foreign aid, <laughs> I've never had the courage to read it. And with a little bit of luck after this morning's session, I won't need to. The format of this session is a panel discussion to be facilitated by Jamie Bartram. We have some excellent panelists and detailed biographies are included in the program. But I'll just introduce them individually, give you a little bit of background as to the roles that they'll be playing and some of their, uh, yes, the roles that they'll be representing uh, in this discussion. I'll begin with Dr. Tessie Saint-Martin who is the president and CEO of Plan International USA, a member of the Global Federation of Plan Organizations, which works to end the cycle of poverty for children. Plan has extensive commitments to water sanitation and hygiene within its very broad portfolio. And Dr. Saint Martin brings over 25 years of experience in addressing a broad range of development challenges with academic training in public administration and a doctorate in political economy and government. She can thus speak with considerable authority from the perspective of a global implementing NGO with broad development agendas, which include WASH. Welcome, Tessie. Patrick Kapoya is the director of the African Sanitation Think Tank, which is an initiative of Water and Sanitation for Africa. Before taking on that role, Mr. Apoya worked for many years uh, working with ma and managing community-based programs at the grassroots level in Ghana. He has very recently served as the executive secretary of the Ghana Coalition of NGOs in Water and Sanitation and is thus able for the purposes of this panel to reflect the views of local implementing NGOs. Welcome, Patrick. Jan Willem Rosenboom is a senior program officer in, in water and sanitation and hygiene strategy for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a major player in both aid and innovation in the water sector. Mr. Rosenboom manages a substantial portfolio of the foundation's investments in both water supply and sanitation and brings to the table over 25 years of experience in international development, focused on WASH. He is thus well placed to reflect the perspective of a major philanthropic foundation in its efforts to aid our sector through creative disruption. <laughs> Welcome, Jan Willem. And finally, Dr. Fred Muhumuza is an economic advisor to the Minister of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development in Uganda. Dr. Muhumuza has a strong academic background in development economics and planning, having taught and researched economics, business, and development studies over the last 17 years. Since 2006, he has been the economic advisor to the Minister of Finance, Planning, and Economic Development, and is thus in an excellent position to view the problem from the point of view of national government, particularly the Ministry of Finance. Welcome, Dr. Mumuza. Now, there is an obvious role that is not represented on this panel. We nearly thought of having an empty chair, but we didn't go that far. And that is the view of bilateral and multilateral official development assistance. At the Water Institute, we were very excited several months ago to learn that Chris Holmes, the Global Water Coordinator for USAID, would be willing to share that perspective with us. Unfortunately, as a result of recent unnameable events in Washington, <laughs> his participation today was not possible. But the spirit was willing, and, and uh, we tip our hat for his, his willingness to, to share that, those ideas. 
Finally, the discussion will be moderated by Professor Jamie Bartram of the Water Institute, whom some of you may have noticed hanging around this place over the last few days. Jamie brings to bear his experience of 15 years at the World Health Organization, where he served as the uh, organization's coordinator for water and sanitation and hygiene for seven years, and has also served as the uh, chair of the overall UN coordination body, UN Water. He is currently the director of the Water Institute, which is committed to innovative research, effective policy, and sound practice in water management, with a particular focus on the intersection of water, health, and development. Jamie, welcome. So Jamie, it's up to you to help us get started in finding out whether or not aid can indeed be part of the solution, or whether it's part of the problem in WASH. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, for those words of introduction. And it was a relief to hear that I'm not the only one that got a book like that. I found it really difficult to open the cover, having invested so much of my life in trying, trying to do the things that are there open to criticism. A, a couple of words of introduction. What are, we, what are the kinds of issues that we hope are going to come out, to, come out of this discussion? We've, we all know, we all see the way in which many donors seek to measure what they're doing, their impact, by things like counting heads, counting, counting beneficiaries. And even in the few days we've been here, we've heard comments about the, the negative in, impact that can have on focusing attention on delivering, but not on sustaining delivery. We've seen in the last few decades a shift in aid thinking. I mean, some countries have moved from a sense of tied aid to untied aid which sounds good, but maybe also brings with it lesser accountability back to donor country taxpayers who believe they've got some say in the way that the money they contribute is, is spent. We've seen a move towards swaps or sector-wide approaches in the hope that they empower developing country governments. Do they work? Or does a swap provide money that is so flexible, it's used to fill holes in different bits of budgets and not really end up being used for the, thing, for the purposes that it was intended. And how do we deal with demands, very reasonable demands, for much more stability, much more dependability in financing flows themselves? The need to develop capacities for, for absorption, which then need funds to be just deployed and used through, used through them. And what really is the accountability of donors to eventual recipients as donors may have less and less direct control of how their own funds are used. And all those things get more and more in sharp focus as we look towards more rights-based program, programming and see people less as recipients of philanthropy and more as rights bearers. And we've also seen a number of reports and some books, Pete, you've ra raised one, that have actually asked questions about, well, does it, ask, does it work at all? Is this aid business a, a good thing? We've recently put together one report that, on the basis of very weak data, but on the data that's available, we were not able to show an impact of volume of aid on the rate of progress in water and sanitation. We couldn't ask the question about whether aid has other roles, for example, in improving sustainability or catalyzing other investments or developing the institutional, <coughs> framework, institutional frameworks that are necessary for effectiveness in action. Now, looking across at my, my colleagues here, what I'd like to do in the next uh, few minutes is to work through two cycles of, of discussion. And I'd like to suggest that we start looking back at the last few decades. Let's look at how things have changed, because they've changed a lot, and look at how that, what we've learned from those changes in that last period. And I'd like to then run a second cycle of this discussion that looks much more to the future, and how we need, now need to look to changing the way we're doing the business we're doing today. Now, the idea of this is not that there's four talking heads, five talking heads if you include myself. We would like this to be a very much a discussion that works with the audience. So rather than have four lead-off comments, I'm going to invite each person to say something very brief. And then I hope, I'm hoping that people would like to come in, engage, ask questions. 
So as anyone in the room has something they want to raise, please can you make your way to the microphone so we can see, what's go see who's interested to speak, and we'll take, the, take this from there. Now, I'm going to be begin with Tessie. Now, you came and spoke last year, and I, I, admit, I, I left your comment, and the, you left the session in which you spoke, and I, the sense I had was one of a, a new broom. Here's someone that's, that's cleaning things and giving us a, a way forward. But you're in a major international NGO that 20, 30 years ago had one of the traditional business models. So what have, what have we seen changed? How, how has PLAN amended the way it works to be a, a, a better contributor to the aid story today as compared to where it was, say, two decades ago? Um, yeah, well, good question, and um, thanks again for, for having me here. Um, well, because, you know, in, in fact, these books that we allude to, you know, does aid work and doesn't it work, I think that the short answer is, you know, we don't know. And a lot of these studies actually talk about volume of aid, and I think, you know, the more interesting questions are around composition of aid. And, and I say that because when you ask me, you know, what, what have we learned, when we look at our own involvement in the sector, um, we started, as, I, as, as many donors do, uh, focused uh, on infrastructure support, right? And, and also working on our own, right? So we would go into communities, and we're very grassroots, for those of you who don't know, Plan International, we work in, you know, um, 80, 90,000 communities, you know, in, in 50 countries. And, you know, we'd go in uh, into those communities, you know, based on uh, some indicators that we thought had a need, and we'd go in and, you know, help build a well, you know, just infrastructure support. Um, and over the years, right, you're asking me how things have changed over the last, uh, you know, 20 years, we've moved away from infrastructure support uh, to really supporting what I would call, so less hardware and more software, right? Uh, more around working with the communities working with water committees in terms of helping them understand, you know, improve planning, budgeting, tariffing. At the same time, we stopped working on our own and realized that, in fact, the community is just part of a broader ecology of actors that needs to be brought into the conversation. And in particular, uh, I mean, you mentioned sort of uh, duty. Um, rights-based approach, right? So in a rights-based approach, yes, the community has certain rights to things, and there, there are the duty bearers in our language, the local authorities, that have a responsibility to provide, and, and a recognition that while they might recognize that they have a responsibility, they don't always, again, have the tools, the capabilities, uh, the experience, and so we work on both sides. We work with the community, an organization, and providing them tools to run their, their own, say, water committees, and at the same time work with local authorities. So if you look at you know, the evolution of, of plans own thinking in terms of how we contribute to the sector, that's how it's changed. Um, and one last thing, you know, one of the things that we do is, and I think I mentioned it last year, we have what we call post-intervention studies. Right? So we'll come back to communities you know, 15 years after we left to take a look at what's happened with all the investments that we made. And what we found in a post-intervention, and we haven't done very many of these, we've just really done one in Kenya, and we're now doing another one in, in Asia, um, I think in the Philippines, that the things that endured are not the infrastructure, but where we were really working with the local community and with the government. So if you care about sustainability, that's what endured. And, and again, it's, it's uh, now, does that mean that there have been vast improvements? You know, probably not. But at least the improvements that were made are continuing, and they've been small improvements, generally. Okay. I'm going to look out in the audience and think, we've got other people in this room who are also from implementing NGOs. And I, are there any counterpoints to the way Tessie's observed what's happened over the last few, few decades? One, th one thing that's, that struck me is, is there anyone getting lost in that, in that process of change? So that, that seems to be a process that won't move away from infrastructure and into supporting communities that's going to work very, very well with an organized community that's relatively well informed, that's got its own internal precedence of, of how to organize, organize itself around an issue. 
Yeah? Correct. Are, we seeing a, are we seeing some populations that are getting left behind in that? The, the less organized of the peri-urban communities or the highly disrupted rural ones. So this is a strategy that's taken us forward a lot in the last, last period, but are we, are we seeing a residue that's getting left behind? Or is that, if we continue with that game, are we going in the right direction? I'm looking out and see if anyone else wants to pick up this conversation, because if not, it's going to carry on as Tessie and Jamie, which is fine. Do you want me to answer? Or, or want, just... I mean, if you'd like to, or let's look out here and see if we can go, go to someone. Who do you think might be interested? Is there like a... Come on, guys. <laughs> Did anybody have coffee? Come on, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's more like it. Two people. Mm. Can I just speak? Or... No, the mm. microphone, the so we can all hear you. Julia, can you go to the mic? <laughs> Otherwise, or the other one. <laughs> Sorry, um, I know it's just when there's a gap and nobody wants to say something and it's about community. Can I just say that that was the best thing I heard, that you know, when you're working with community and government, those things endure. Um, basically, I, I would just like to add to that dynamic by saying that we assume when we talk about, we all talk about communities, but we actually assume they're functional. We talk about community as if they are a reconstructed group. They're not usually functional. And our experience, I'm from Africa ahead, um, by the way, an NGO in Southern Africa, um, you know, what we find is that we, our best bet is to go in there and assist communities to organize and become functional. And we do this, and you know, everyone knows my work through community health clubs. There are other ways of doing it, but once they're organized and they're constituted and they have a leader and they've got a mandate to go and interfere in everybody else's households and clean up, that's when we really find change. And I wonder if you've had any um, thoughts on, on, on how to organize communities in the long term. Um, well, I mean, I've got, I'll, yeah, I mean, that's a longer conversation. And I would agree that, that the first order of business is organizing the community. So you, you, you're right. We're kind of assuming that there's this community there. And, you know, there, and of course, if they're already organized or if, or if it's a stable community, right? So in places where you've got large migration patterns and so on, and there are less communities, uh, there, sort of there's less stability around those communities, this, this is harder. It, I think it's still relevant, um, and and you know your question about you know what have we learned? I think honestly we're still learning, right? So we've got a model that works very well in stable uh, development settings, uh, and I would say that that's you know that that a lot of times we think that urban or peri-urban settings are less stable because there's more migration. But the fact of the matter is that there's a, a fair amount of stability in those settings. I think that w what we don't know a lot, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it, is um, in, in fragile, you know, conflict-affected you know, environments. Uh, and what is the transition then from what you might do initially to, to then what you do over time you know, when you get into a more stable post-conflict, you know, less, less unstable post-conflict environment? I guess my question, I'm Rodney Harrington, I'm with Aqua Research, and <clears throat> my question is more, I guess, along the lines of what you alluded to, or what you're alluding to now. American Water Works Association uh, members, philanthropic branch is Water for People, and they have a philosophy that says, we'll go in for 10 years if all the criteria aren't in place to begin with, for it to succeed in 10 years. If we can't walk away in 10 years, we don't go there. So that address, I mean, that. It raises the question about what do you do for organizations or areas that don't meet the criteria. And then, but then there's, you know, I've heard a lot of complaints about you're just throwing money at a problem, you walk away, and it just degrades. And I've, I've heard, I guess, that the Gates Foundation has kind of approached that philosophy of go to places where they're sustainable, you know, on an economic basis. Uh, Mr. Hammond's com uh, conversation the other day regarding uh, the profit motive or uh, giving people, uh, you know, the social uh, pressures, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. I guess, you know, I, I, I resonate to that as a businessman, that, it, that if, if you make it profitable for people all along the food chain, that this thing will work. So I, this is just a comment, I mean, for discussion. Uh, hi, my name is Muti. I'm with Water for People Malawi. Um, 
Don't you think as organizations we're assuming that development in and of itself is incentive enough for people to want to change? Because I, I sort of get, I sort of think we assume that a lot in the way we work. And most of the time the community structures we set up fall apart shortly after because we think development in and of itself is an incentive for people to want change in their communities. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. That's just my, that's something I've sort of observed working in development over the past eight or nine years I've been in it, that we assume communities see that as an incentive. And I found that the most powerful incentive is, is economic, financial. That's the one that sticks. But in some instances, there are some that you, there's no way you can monetize it. Um, so I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. How can we get people to actually see development in and of itself as an incentive? I'm, I'm going to suggest before yeah. Tessie, I don't know if Tessie wants to respond, but I was going to look out in the audience, and I hope Greg Allgood's awake. But yes, he is. There he is. Greg, you, you gave us a statistic the other day about how long in, in World Vision programs you think you need to invest in order that, that commun community management works. Can you give us that statistic? Because I thought that was quite remarkable. Mm. I'll have to give credit to my uh, colleague, Emmanuel Pong, for that. Yeah. He, uh, is Emmanuel here? I don't think so. He, he, is, he uh, was assigned to be the person who did the software, as much as Tessie was saying, where we were digging wells in, in Ghana. We've been doing it for five years with, with funds from USAID and um, had reached about 500,000 people. And Emmanuel was assigned to do the software part. We only had a couple of people doing it. But Emmanuel sort of took the view that you have to help the community understand that a new well is like a new baby. And if you don't feed it, and you know, if you don't take care of it, it's going to die. And so he went from a staff of about two to a staff of 40. He, he had his staff live in the community for six weeks before they did anything. Um, and so eventually they learned to talk to the community so that they could empower themselves to take care of these wells. And, as uh, the Water uh, Sanitation Africa study showed, um, we've recently gone back and looked at the sustainability of those wells and found that, in fact, they did endure a long time, 80%, nearly 80% functioning uh, one or two decades after uh, Emmanuel did that deep community engagement. It was probably because of his background as a nurse um, and public health instead of engineering that allowed him to have that, that kind of dialogue with communities. I'd like to use that to transition along, along the line here a little bit because we, we've, we've heard an account of really quite ex extensive change, a move from a very infrastructure focus to a much more software focus to much more engagement with others. And many of the agencies, like your own, the work that's actually done is done by local NGOs. Cool. The, so, Patrick, could you come into the conversation? How do these changes pl play out in the kind of NGOs that are actually delivering and do, doing the work rather than driving what ought to be done. Thank you. Uh, if you just cast your minds back to the, the 70s, the 80s, uh, a lot of the interventions from donors, from NGOs, were driven by motivations of humanitarian assistance uh, to groups that were deprived. And it was also the period that African governments, uh, or most developing country governments, were almost in shambles. Uh, military rules that did not have any accountability to their citizens and therefore it was logical for NGOs to step in uh, to fill that space. Now uh, two things changed that getting to the 90s when governments started shaping and putting systems in place they won donor confidence and a bulk of the aid that was going through NGOs began to flow through the government systems and uh, at the same time NGOs that had worked for two decades under the direct humanitarian support, began to also realize that the mileage that they thought they would have achieved was not being achieved, partly because of the reasons that uh, my colleague cited earlier on, the issue of sustainability of the infrastructure, and the fact that uh, a lot of the interventions that were put in place did not really uh, have the community ownership uh, driving them. And as a result of that, NGOs had to first look at the bulk of the aid coming through government was the one that was going to solve the problem. So it was logical for NGOs to begin to think about moving away from direct service delivery to engaging governments on how the aid that is coming could be better applied. So that was a logical foundation for the issue of advocacy and policy engagement, interested in how the policies are formulated, interested in the proposed issues. Because anything that was not well captured in the policy 
uh, was not going to be addressed. So that was one of the driving forces behind NGOs having to adapt from direct service delivery to uh, advocacy and policy engagement. At the same time, the question of community ownership became very critical. And therefore, those who still had to remain in service delivery and infrastructure provision had to rethink the way they could better uh, get community ownership uh, drive the development. And that was the era that we had this uh, PRA, community participation methodologies. So a lot of the investments then went into the software uh, uh, more than the hardware. But again, we've now reached a stage where we've seen confusion in both, on both the NGO side and also on the government side. Uh, governments are leading developments now, but we also have a lot of the aid now just being duplicated, being confused, uncoordinated, and governments now are a bit uh, 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 confused. I, I would say they're being dragged in different directions, and we are seeing that the effectiveness of the aid is not what you would normally expect given the volumes that are coming in. Again, NGOs now have to contend with donors, not just governments and communities, but the relationship with donors on how we could explore better ways of uh, uh, giving that aid. And uh, I think uh, uh, the issue of the, 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 the inability to conclude about the effectiveness of aid is real. Of course, as a direct beneficiary of aid, I would say it has worked. But for aid, I couldn't have been sitting here. And for Ghana that we all know about, Guinea women could, could never have been eliminated without donor uh, support in, in, in that direction. So it does work. But it could have worked far better than what it has achieved so far. And the NGO uh, dynamic now is not necessarily about service delivery, but now also beginning to give way to market principles, to begin to understand that market that we previously thought had no role in uh, proposed interventions now has a role. So the, there's a new shift towards looking at harnessing the corporate power to add to the momentum that we currently have. There's a lot of private involvement in the health sector, in the education sector, but very minimal in the watch sector. And it is largely because of the unregulated nature of the, 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 the framework or the environments that makes it difficult to see how to fit in the private interventions uh, in our countries. So that, for me, has been the, the logical evolution and the drivers of the evolution of uh, aid in our countries. I'm hoping that some, someone's going to come in and do the brave thing that Juliet did last time and be the first to, to, to go up to a microphone to pick up, pick up on this bit of conversation. But that's quite, it's, it's very comfortable when we can describe our history in that way, isn't it? We've seen a series of, series of changes and it's reassuring and we can document them and we can describe them. And we have, do have at least one person. Uh, thank you. I'm Michael Forsen from UNICEF. Yes, uh, very interesting conversation talking about the aid and all those things. And what I would like to say is uh, maybe picking up from where Patrick uh, was talking about. Actually, aid is quite useful in certain circumstances. But then talking about ownership also, uh, this is the time where we need to try and strike a balance between the government's responsibility and then the aid. For example, there was a study in Ghana in the uh, rural water sector where we saw that aid accounts for 95% of the government budget. And because of that, the sector was heavily donor driven. And most of the programs or the projects, let me put the projects that were run, were all, I mean, the results were all engineering driven, just counting numbers without looking at the impact. And just getting to the end, you see that we are all rushing only to spend and to give the numbers rather than looking at the sustainability. So I think that in as much as it's very useful, we need to know when to tape off and then bring in the government's responsibility. Uh, an example that happened in Ghana is we came up with what, uh, a dialogue, as we call the uh, certain indicators in the dialogue with the government leading to the sector-wide approach. We looked at the government's responsibility. And one of the uh, things we put on the table is that if we don't see increased government expenditure, then the donors were going to pull off from certain uh, interventions. 
And interestingly, we saw budget allocations coming up. In fact, some of these uh, issues, it's not that the government may not be able to do it, but just because they feel the donors are there, they feel the aid will come. So the focus of the government shifts into other sectors. Secondly, uh, for w better targeting of the aid, I think uh, the various sectors really will need to look at a comprehensive sector development plan. Based on that, then we will know where the aid is really focused. Aid is very useful, but then when it goes into payment of salaries, then it becomes unsustainable, which becomes a very big challenge to the government. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colleen Naughton from University of South Florida. I'm an engineer by background, so I feel like I should speak up here. <laughs> but uh, as far as my uh, background, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali, and just a switch from hardware to software, which I think we really need to focus on. But I've also seen it in action by plan, by World Vision, by even Peace Corps itself. And these people going to these uh, sort of formations or education, more software um, forming committees, and they go to them and I ask afterwards, what did you learn? And they're like, oh, we went there for free food, or what we're going to get for free. And so while it's great to really, em we need to emphasize software, um, it's more difficult to measure, and I think may not have the impact that we think it's having when in the design phase. Just to fill some information. Yeah, um, just to, there's one element of uh, Forson's contribution that uh, uh, in itself is a, is a problem. That is how it is defined. And uh, on the basis of how it is defined, governments saw that they were contributing very little. But when governments also started getting stronger and they decided to unpack what that aid is, in the case of Ghana, we've always believed that donors are providing 95% because uh, they drive a lot of the interventions. Now, when government was forced to the wall under the SWA initiative, and they decided to unpack what went into that aid, they actually indeed recognized that government is contributing 78%, and donors, the little. Because they decided to remove all the World Bank loans that the government is paying back. All the French AFD loans that they are paying back. Any loan which government was paying back or servicing was removed from that definition of aid. And when that happened, and when government proved that on a yearly basis they are paying, and if they are paying, you can no longer call it donor money, things changed. And on, governments just don't recognize that this is how much they are putting, just because of the way we have defined the aid. And because of that, they, they, they rarely have the ability to tell World Bank that we don't like the way you set up. They have the project managers, they do the no objections, they do the uh, 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 whatever has to happen, they actually control. If it is not finished, they keep the money back. And that is one of the things that is causing the, 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 the hiccups in the flow of aid. Swaps have been discussed, but it is it's very clear that few donors are committed to actually sector-wide approach, where they actually finance the government budget and uh, uh, all agree on a common monitoring system using common government systems to apply aid. Unless we reach there, we are never going to get the true value of aid. Uh, yes, my name is Arno Rosemarin from Stockholm Environment Institute. I think uh, Patrick um, epitomized what I was going to say. Um, I think there's a need, if you like, for this discussion to unpack what we mean by aid. Um, partially because uh, the UN agencies don't work the same way the bilaterals work, don't work the same way the development banks work. Um, there's something called EU aid, which I wouldn't call bilateral or UN. Mm. Uh, there's the private sector, there's international NGOs, there's philanthropy, and then there's something really interesting which maybe a lot of us know a lot more about, and that is the actual training and exchange programs um, of actually uh, shifting training uh, back and forth. Um, the theory of, of accountability uh, is not um, well practiced. Uh, yesterday in my uh, failures, uh, paper that I gave, I, I spoke about the uh, EU audit on WASH projects for the last 10 years. It was released 10 years uh, after um, a billion uh, euros were spent uh, in sub-Sahara Africa projects. Uh, about half of these have not delivered for different reasons. The main reason being that capacity wasn't addressed properly 
that uh, things were installed on the ground, but there was no longevity because of the lack of uh, capacity to maintain these wash systems. Uh, little learning as well, I would say, from, from that. Um, I want just a comment on, on, on some of the big uh, actors, for example, UNICEF. Uh, my own government in Sweden has, has a very strong principle that UN agencies are not uh, supposed to be tendered. And in fact, if a bilateral is interested in, in donating money or providing a project, uh, they just can go to any UN agency and there, there's no accountability requirement or any tendering requirement. Whereas all of us that work for universities, uh, research institutes, what have you, have uh, 10 times the amount of accountability placed on them when they, when they have to tender, etc. Um, that is, a, I would think, uh, something that has to change. I think um, some of the larger UN agencies need, need that pressure on them. So I'll leave you with that message. I think accountability is something that we're going we're to come back to. I suspect a lot in the second cycle of this. But I'd like to try and move, move us along, along the line one more. Jan Willem, we, we're hearing quite a lot, an undercurrent here, which is very much to do with stability and dependability, swaps, more stable financing flows and so on. And yet, the period we started talking about two, three decades ago, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation wasn't with us. So you're the, kind of the new kid on the block. <laughs> and somehow at the same time, you're the 900 pound gorilla in the room. I'm not sure how you're both those things at once, but you know. But the, the foundation's there playing a disruptive role. And in some way that disruptive role is in tension with this call for more stability and reliability. How do we navigate that tension between those two things? Mm -hmm. I think if you, if you know me at all, you know, I'll, I'll probably to bring a little bit more humility to my answer than a 900 pound gorilla might. Mm -hmm. um, but before I, um, before I talk about the foundation, I actually wanted to react to something Patrick said, um, you know, it's like, and, and the gentleman from UNICEF echoed, you know, age a good thing and it works in, in my eyes. Um, the paper you wrote, um, co-authored, said, oh, we, we have really bad data and it's, it's hard to see the link between improvements in, in water and aid. And I think it, it's a good start to say, let's step back a moment and um, look at the fact that a kid born today, almost anywhere in the world, is more likely to um, survive her birth, get an education, have access to clean water, make more money, um, survive the birth of her own children and, and die of old age, than almost at any point um, in history. And the role of aid in that may be tiny. Yeah, that's another thing we need to be very, very humble about because it's a drop in the bucket when you look at it. But if I didn't believe that aid had something to do with that, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Um, so in, in terms of the, the effectiveness of, of what we do, does it have an impact? Um, yes, we can look at the micro scale and claim success and then look at the macro scale and say, oh, it's actually very difficult to see what influence that has. But let's keep in mind sort of that overall picture of progress that um, that we have been able to see. And you called the foundation a disruptive influence. One of the reasons that I wanted to go work with the foundation three years ago, uh, coming from a life spent mostly out in the field in, uh, in Africa and Asia, working on, on sanitation projects and water projects, was that we are looking for scalable, sustainable solutions and that, that whole question of how do we get to sustainable outcomes has surfaced a number of times. Um, and we take big risks in doing that um, and, and build partnerships along the way. And if I look at how long have we been around as a foundation? 13 years. Um, we've had an official WASH strategy of three years out of those 13. And before that, we ran a um, we call ourselves a learning initiative. 
So we had six years of learning where we said, okay, we need to understand the sector. We need to understand who plays um, a role in that. We need to gather evidence uh, about what solutions work, um, how, how we can deliver. And so we engaged very, very broadly um, in the sector and looked at identifying some of the big issues that everybody seems to be struggling with. Um, sustainability, the, the question of, of what does this all cost, this delivery of services and um, how do we measure it, um, resonates in your paper. Um, I would love to look at, at Tessie and, and say one of my early realizations working in, in making a grant, a grant to plan three years ago is that every implementing agency could tell me how much money they wanted to have from me to run a program. But nobody can tell me what it costs to deliver services. What do the households pay? What does the government contribute? What is the, the sort of grant contribution there? So we set out to figure out, well, how can we help the sector in measure that better? We looked at delivery at scale, uh, the TSSM program in India and Indonesia and Tanzania is one example uh, that many people are familiar with. Um, so I think rather than setting out to be disruptive, we set out to understand what are the big issues in the sector and how can we um, engage with the sector in finding some answers. And it's only been the last three years where we have made the decision to really narrowly focus on sanitation because that's a very uh, neglected area and talking about water supply and sanitation too often ends up talking about water supply and sanitation. Yeah. You know, so, um, <laughs> so we're strongly focused and incredibly audacious, right? I mean, everybody now knows the, the, the foundation for our reinvent the toilet uh, initiative where we said, okay, we're going to go out and solve a problem that nobody is, is engaging with, which is what happens in urban areas to all those people that can't afford a toilet, that needs clean water to flush and a sewer and all the infrastructure that, that comes after that. Um, and by the way, when we, when we measure how that works, we kind of measure at the front end of that whole problem. And we assume that if somebody is connected to a toilet, um, everything is well, and we actually know from some great presentations here by, uh, by Barbara, for example, yesterday, that that's not true. A lot of that stuff flows into the environment. So we said, okay, we're going to address that, and we're going to address that in a way that nobody's done before. We're going to reinvent a toilet that doesn't need to be connected to water in a sewer, um, and it's going to operate on you know, five cents per user per day, um, and we're going to develop a number of technologies next to that that help us address existing uh, business models for pit emptying, for waste treatment, stuff like that. What is often forgotten in um, that um, sort of visibility of, of this, this audacious goal where we say, okay, we're going to do this in the next, uh, in the next 10 years. It's going to be incredibly disruptive. If we are successful, uh, we're going to have to have new business models uh, and, and other ways of doing things. But what may be much less visible, but is still there, is our whole engagement in building the kind of partnerships that allow aid to be a tool um, to increase the responsiveness and the accountability of the state. Um, the kind of partnerships with donors, private sector, government, that you're talking about that, that look for stability, that look for understanding. Um, and the press may not write about it, but that doesn't mean we're not engaged in it. Um, and one great example is the, you know, the Sanitation and Water for All initiative, um, which is a, a mechanism to do just that, bring, bring donors and governments together to figure out how we improve performance of, of aid in the sector. Our partnership with uh, uh, the Water and Sanitation uh, for Africa is another example of saying, okay, how can we support a, a Africa-wide um, membership organization that improves performance in, in Africa? So I appreciate 
the fact that you say, oh, the, the foundation is a disruptive influence, and in some ways we may end up being that in the sector, but I would also hope that we're contributing to the problems and, and the conversation around sustainability and understanding and improving uh, accountability and performance um, at the same time. Thank you. That's really clear. I, I saw Paul, I think you were walking up to ask something. Is there anyone else that would like to come in on, come in on this part of the conversation? <laughs> is a race to the microphone. Could I, could I suggest that we sort of change the title of this session, not from is aid part of the solution, but actually what aid is part of the solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that struck me over the last few years is that um, some donors actually do good stuff and other donors make things worse. We've spoken about sustainability and failure of EU projects in Africa, and indeed it's not just EU projects, it's much wider than, than that donor, but across many donors. Some donors are very good, some donors are very bad, and they're good or bad depending on how much consideration they give to sustainability. Lack of sustainability is not a neutral thing. It's not, oh, if it works, it'll be great, but if it doesn't work, if the well is still providing water, Next year, great, and if it doesn't, well, you know, things won't have changed. It doesn't work like that. If you provide an intervention that lasts a year and then it fails, you make things worse than if you hadn't bothered in the first place. And any model of delivering aid, which is a busload of teenagers arriving, digging a well, and then get partying and going away, is going to make people's lives worse. And I think as soon as we actually get hold of that and look at NGOs working in Africa and, and Haiti and, and Southeast Asia and wherever and say, you are making things worse, get lost, the better. <laughs> Not that you have strong opinions. <laughs> I never have strong opinions about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never sure he's been on a bus, load of t on a bus with a load of teenagers either, but that's another point. Um, I just wanted to share something It's slightly linked to this um, that a colleague of mine in India said to me quite a long time ago about thinking about uh, aid or any kind of intervention or funding that you put into an existing system. And I think that's really sort of linking in to Paul's point in the sense that I think a lot of interventions somehow for whatever reason, or the risk is that they sometimes happen as if there's nothing there before. It's as if the whole of Africa is full of people just sort of sitting, doing nothing, waiting for something to arrive to help, which of course isn't the case. But a little bit linked to that as well, a, a colleague of mine in the Ministry of Urban Affairs in India once said to me that for him, one of the really useful things that external funding agencies can do is finance things that are risky politically. Because one of the things that's a theme in all of this is we don't actually know what works, and what works will change over time, and getting things to work is very difficult. So a useful disrupting influence thing to do is to try and support things that it would be very hard for governments to do because they are within the ongoing political process. So you can, you can finance a thing that might work or might not work, and you are slightly protecting your colleagues in government from the risk of failure, if you like. And I think it's something that, that donors should be more proud of when they do it. And we, you know, if things fail, sometimes that's quite a good thing because you've tried it, it didn't work, you've learned something, and you haven't carried down the ministry with you while that kind of all went wrong. So I think that idea of helping governments to take risk is another aspect of what we can do as external agents in this process. Oh, you're a little dull. Um, John Walters, the, the University of Colorado. And so this is a perfect segue, actually. Um, in talking about 900-pound gorillas, I'm, I, I guess I'm going to bring up the topic of, I guess, the, the elephant in the room, this 10,000-pound elephant. Uh, what about government corruption um, and, and, and the confounding um, influence of that on, on aid? Um, how, how do we address that? Well, I think we couldn't have had a better segue from those last two. And I'm going to look across to, the, to, to Fred to take the next, next bit of the discussion ahead. Because they, they set the scene. We, we have this 
the role of aid in innovation, supporting government, enhancing risk-taking. So we, from disruption from being something negative into being something quite positive if it's done, done in the right way. But Fred, you, you sit in, you're, you're part of a, a national system, part of a ministry of, 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 of finance. Um, there's a lot of people in the room that are trying to tell you how to do your job or to trying to tell elected officials how they ought to, ought to act. So there's, a, there's another tension, tension in the room that's between all of this aid that's trying to create disruption and change and do things better and the accountability of elected officials to their own electorates. Can you talk for a few minutes about how some of that plays out? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. I think it's a, a serious issue of what has transpired over the last possibly 20 years where we brought in swaps, NGOs came in on the advocacy side as they have rightfully said, the money was going into government. So the main thing was to push these governments to do what this money should do. And this has been a little bit more disruptive than constructive quite often. Uh, because quite a number of NGOs would come in with this little eye. They are so passionate about WASH. They forget that government has also the security aspect to deal with. As you have said, it is also the community that they the votes came from who asked for a million things out there. There's roads, there's education. So sitting on my desk every day, I receive all these letters. None of them is converging onto any specific thing. Leave alone that I've also, before that or after that, I've also received the letter from the president. And the way those letters are phrased is this is a directive. In other words, not for debate. So you have to shelve all the others. So the policy space has become a little bit more messy to a government bureaucrat who has to make sense out of all these issues. And uh, talking about these disruptions, I think the, the, there is also the other aspect of people not understanding or they, they, they do not appreciate the complexity that this is not, first of all, a linear process. The process is a little bit messed up with all sorts of interests in there. Some of them may be for good causes, others may not be for good causes, but you must deal with all these multiple interests in this policy space, including the civil society and others who have come into play. Now, all these introduce noise, and I think the Bill and Melinda Gates will help in some of these uh, further research that needs to be done going forward because of their experience, I think, in modeling noise and programming engineers that between the transmitter and the receiver, things are not as obvious. What you put your money to do, it's not exactly what is going to happen out there because we do not understand the in-between, mm -hmm. the noise, things that engineers, communication engineers and programmers have done well to perfect so that we can talk on our mobile phones and watch our televisions. The policy signals are similarly of that nature. And I think that has been uh, messed up. Also, the design of the swaps, because these are sector-wide approaches, and every sector says, hey, I'm in charge of my issues here. Whatever falls in between is a cross-cutting issue. So you throw it in the cross-cutting basket that nobody ever deals with. Right. <laughs> now, so you have some sanitation and water issues in the education sector. So part of that money for water and sanitation is put into the education sector. But remember, the education sector sets its own priorities. And water and sanitation is not a priority. It's about counting numbers. How many children are in school? How many teachers? What is the teacher-people ratio? So they are building classrooms. They are putting in children. They are putting teachers in place. There is no sanitation facility <coughs> at the school. Now, the water sector cannot go in because that's the education sector. So this silo business of operation has also become a little bit more of a, a messy problem. And as I've said, let's not forget the politics. You've just sampled a little bit of it uh, in these open environments. And anybody may be looking at Washington and see the bad of what has been transpiring there. This transpires in many other countries every other day, except that it is not open. We do not know what our levels of debt are. We don't have debt ceilings. We can't even hold accountable where the money has gone. To the extent that I'm now thinking, apart from governments, non-government organizations, there is also now a new evolution of no government organizations. Any all. 
<laughs> this is a no government organization, but is running actually government business. They are not accountable to the people, but they will be quick to receive money on behalf of the people, including aid, sit down as an organization running government, and decide whether to keep it in some which account, decide on what they want to do with it, and it has possibly nothing to do with the communities. So it's a bit of issues that we need to really understand. And I think we need the disruptive intervention, the disruption has already taken place. We need to rethink government, we need to rethink the development agenda, the development processes, and that research is out there. A little bit scattered, and that's why I like the theme of this conference, where science meets policy. Only that quite often, science never meets the policy space in the way it should. So we need knowledge management to get it there. But also we need to understand that policy space. How would they receive the science? How would they use it? But some of that science is also not there. Some of the designs, and I chair the World Vision Board in Uganda, some of the designs we have found that have come up from science are not applicable at all. We have so many dry boreholes across government. Mm -hmm. Now for us as an NGO, we took an interest to say, what a waste. What can we do to make to understand better these dry boreholes? And one of the things that came out was, when human beings are settling on a place, they have no idea how much water is underground. So for you to just come and say, oh, there are people settled here, let's give them a borehole. You are taking an assumption that there is enough water underground to sustain that borehole, sustain that community. So two months, two years, it dries out. Maybe you need other models. So these are complexities that I face in government every other day. And many times I just close my door, I've evolved a standard template of a response to every sector that says, we need more money. I just print it out, take it to my minister for signature, sorry, the budget is constrained. The budget is constrained. Uh, I, want to, I don't know whether we have already discussed it, but I want to speak like a village boy and respond to the question, is it part of the solution? I think it is. If you have, you have lived in a rural area where you have to walk long distances to look for water, if you lost a sister like I lost a sister many years ago as a result of water-related diseases, then it works. It's important to you when, whether it's an NGO or non-government or no government, moves into your area and provides water for you and improves your sanitation, that it works. I think the other issue which we need to look at, we have been spending time talking about sustainability. And I think sometimes we think organizations need to drive sustainability. But for me as a rural person living in the rural area, sustainability, most of the dynamics of ensuring sustainability come from those who benefit from the facility. And the challenge we have is, do we create enough space for them to be able to sustain the benefits of the products that they have received? Do I understand the responsibilities that I have? Do we have the, the local governance system as well as the political governance systems well established and created within that space for me to know my responsibility and for the others to take their responsibility? So I think that organizations or governments who, who use aid to support us, who come from the rural area, need to create enough space for us. And sometimes we rush through without creating that space for us to sustain and maintain the facility. Additionally, we are treated like we are divided persons. Uh, uh, I tell my story that growing up in a village, when I get up, my mother tells me, go to the water point and fetch water. Meanwhile, she's saying, telling my other brother, will you sharpen the cutlass for us to go to the farm? So food security issues are related to water. And so when we have organizations who are working and do not see the pieces together and how they are integrated, then we create the confusion and the distortions within that divide us, that I have to attend 10 meetings which address different things, but I'm a person as a whole. So I think organizations need to begin to, to build those partnerships that are essential to meet the pieces that they are not able to address. So if I'm doing water supply and sanitation, I need to look at where is the gap in relation to food security. Where is the gap in relation to economic development? So that even though I do not have resources for that, 
I should be able to, to be humble enough to extend my, my inadequacy to bring in other people to support the village person to be able to sustain and maximize the benefits of whatever we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Destina Samani. I work for Water and Sanitation for Africa. Mine is a question, and the question is, what constitutes an effective aid, and how do we measure that? From experience, we've realized that they design projects and programs, and we see a huge number of consultants on it. Should we be counting all that as part of the aid, or we have to unpack and what really goes to the ground should be the aid. So I think I would need a clarity of what constitutes that aid. Thank you. I think there's a very nice matching between this idea, what, what constitutes aid, and the discussions we've already heard about accountability and effectiveness in the field. What I'd like to do is, is draw us forward, and I'm going to go through all, all four of our panel, panel here in turn and ask everyone to flag up, I'm going to say one thing, you could do more than one if you like, but could you try and step forward a few years and imagine a, a meeting like this in let's say 20 years time. Actually we'll probably all be doing that electronically by then, but yeah, let's leave it. But there's a meeting like this and at some point in the meeting someone says, do you remember that thing in Chapel Hill in 2013 when they talked about? And they said we, that the future would be different, we had to do things differently. So what are, the, what are the things that, from that optic of the future, are going to look like very wise foresight on the things that have to change? Or alternatively, what are the things that it would be, well, that was a really bad call, that we really shouldn't have gone down that road. So in effect, what would you like to see changing in the coming period? Just like we've looked back at history and said, what have we changed in the last 20 years? What are the factors we're dealing with today? What do you think needs to happen next? What's the next big change that you see on the horizon? I don't know who would like to, to start. Tessie, are you willing to lead in on that? Sure, why not? Um, yeah, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know that this is particularly you know, insightful or whatever, but um, so a, a few thoughts. One is, you know, as I, as I listen to all the comments and so on, obviously right now we've got you know, a big coordination problem and a big information sharing problem, right? So uh, that, that the governments face you know, every day and that I think all donors face. Um, and, and, we, you know, and in fact, the question of you know, does aid work? Well, you know, what kind of aid are we talking about? And there's a lot of aid that happens that doesn't even get into any of the official books or studies that we're referring to, right? So what, um, you know, we can capture what OECD countries are doing. Are, are, are we capturing what new emerging donors are doing? You know, is, is what China is doing, um, you know, uh, transparent and, and uh, part of the figures that we're looking at? I don't think so, and China's not the only one. They're new emerging donors, they're not part of the same thing, and that the, the data and what they're doing is not in, entirely clear, and by the way, neither is the, the things, neither are the things that INGOs like mine are doing, and they're doing all kinds of things, and that's not part of any kind of official, you know, uh, data set. So we don't even know what we're each doing, um, and and I think that's one of the issues that we have to solve. Um, when I was here, you know, last year, I talked about things like the International Aid Transparency Initiative. It's not what is going to solve problems for everybody. And it doesn't necessarily even solve the problems that we're talking about here, but, but those types of things are important because it gives a common standard uh, you know, that we're all using to report on. But even if we can all, you know, even though all governments have agreed to, or many governments have agreed to things like IATI, they still don't include INGOs, right? And, and so, you know, so one thing has to do with data sharing uh, to address this problem of coordination. Um, there are other things I think that we need to think about. Another theme that we've heard here is, you know, partnerships matter and we're trying to, we, we're still grappling with how to partner together. There are a number of new actors, as I just talked about, um, that include for-profit private sector, that include, you know, big 800-pound gorillas like, you know, Gates, uh, that, that include 
Um, you know, again, I, I NGOs uh, and local NGOs and um, figuring out what effective partnerships are is one of the, the things that I don't think that we have solved uh, or that we have even thought about how we solve. Um, a third thing that I think we need to solve, and I hope when we sit here in 20 years we, we will have solved, is the whole issue, um, uh, and I think Fred alluded to, is we work in silos. You know? I mean, this is a conference on WASH. You know, um, and so you're going to see like health people. You know, do you see enough people that understand private sector development in in a in a conference like this? You know, we need to start breaking those those silos. I mean, if if you're in education, you only think about education. Honestly, the reason why I think that plans should be doing wash is because it has a direct effect on whether children and especially girls go to school. Right. That's why I, I so I I see a direct link between what we're doing in WASH and what we're doing in education, but usually education people and WASH people don't talk to each other. So really breaking the silos and finding solutions from one sector that can be applied to another is, is another thing that we absolutely have to solve. Otherwise, we're just running around in circles trying to solve problems that maybe you know, could use insights from, um, from other sectors. So maybe I'll just leave it at, oh, one, can I say one last thing? Uh, yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> And because uh, somebody talked about, um, and he said, I'm not saying that this is something we have to resolve, but it certainly is a tension between accountability, which you know, I think all of this greater information sharing and transparency does, you know, would do. It, it increases accountability. But there's a tension between that and wanting to be accountable and, and having and wanting and needing to take risks. Okay, and you know, and we, are in this, we're in a very risky enterprise, those of us that are in international development. Yet we rarely talk about the risks to any of our donors. I mean, certainly when I have a conversation with my individual donors, I say, you know, I'll take your money and I'll do good things with it. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, right? Because in fact, we don't know exactly what works and we need to be able to look at this uh, as, you know, as risky enterprises and we need to be comfortable with that. And we need to, to find the right balance between why didn't you do what, I, what you said you were going to do and the knowledge that, wow, I mean, you know, we're not exactly sure how all of these things work. So can I, nice can I react yeah. to that for a moment? I remember the conversation we had last year after, I don't know who was all here, but you stood up on stage and very courageously talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of um, NGO implementation. And after that, we had a discussion, and I said, I really hope that you're having this discussion with all your other donors. Uh, as Gates, I can very clearly say, okay, we're comfortable with that conversation about what works and what doesn't work. That's what it entails to take risk. And, and you said, well, that's very much and a two-edged sword. You know, I'd love to, but I'm going to lose my, my charity rating, I'm going to lose my donors. Um, and so, much before 20 years from now, I would dearly love that, hope that we would have that figured out where we have that open conversation about what works, what doesn't work, and actually that should maybe be a theme in one of these conferences. What do we need to stop doing? Yeah, what really yeah. doesn't work? Um, one of the things I hope the foundation will sort out in the next 20 years is, is to move on from not just the, the innovation part of the agenda, but also to figure out, well, what does delivery look like? Because in many ways, you know, innovation is, um, is the easy bit, relatively speaking. Um, but it's the delivery that really kills us in, in, in many cases again and again and again, because we can't figure it out. We can't figure out the sustainability. There's frankly a lot of trial and error where we are not open about enough about the error. Let's not do this, let's, let's find other ways. Um, so if I'm still here 20 years from now, um, online or in person, I would hope that that whole conversation has really moved uh, 
moved along and we, we figured out delivery and we figured out sustainability and we're talking about services and not about a busload of, of students that come dig a well and that, you know, it's, it's again that first bit and, and then the rest that comes after it, so. Frank, weary, weary glimpse of the future. I think 20 years from now we need to have uh, learned new uh, terminologies. One of what I would see, I'm a, 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 I enjoy soccer, the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> so we call it soccer, we call it, we call it football, the other side. <laughs> but I think looking at that beautiful game coming to Brazil next year, what do I see? I think we need to replace some of the words we're using because they're not helping. Partnerships. It sounds nice, but if you're, all you are doing is to put partners together, and you know they are not homogeneous. They have all the different interests. The government has a different interest. The private sector, some of them are just rent seekers. They are coming in to just cream everybody off. They are so skilled on this. They can hire the best brains. They can give you the best presentations. And when this matches the weak capacities in government, the public sector is the net loser. You might even find connivance within government to work with the private sector. And you're bringing these partners together, building a partnership. And all of them are looking at the 900 pound gorilla in the room and say, hey, how do we feast on this? This is quite big. It can take us for a week. It can take us for weeks. You know, and they are bringing that partnership as well. So I think we need to replace this with team building, soccer teams. Different people play different roles, but they are all focused on one goal. You want to do as many goals the other side as possible because that gives you the points. So how do we all come together in this development space and focus on one goal, regardless of our own other skills and unique futures that we are bringing in together? So I think we need to go beyond just mere partnerships and say how can we build uh, teams that actually are coherent and bringing in these dimensions. And this takes me to the next level of addressing the smaller picture issues. Who are these actors? We need to understand the strength, the weaknesses of each of the individual people or entities we are bringing on the team. If this is a predatory state, the no government organizations, don't think it is going to be like a government. You have to handle this differently. So even the people bringing in aid, if it's going to be effective and work, you need to first understand what type of government am I dealing with. One of the dangers that happens was budget support. We thought this was going to bring in good ownership of country, governments would be responsible, the countries will take, let's release the strings on it, let's put the money into a pool. It has bought more weapons, it has led to all sorts of things. So predatory states and non-developmental states should be treated differently. We need to understand that going forward. Thank you. Patrick. Well yeah, very quickly. Um, from the donor side, uh, I would like to see better coordination of how uh, aid is packaged and delivered. And a good example we are already beginning to see was a SEMA initiative. I don't know how far it has gone. Uh, that involved the Rockefeller Foundation, the Hiltons, and the Gates, and the others. Uh, that is the way I, I believe a form of partnership among a group of people who even have some diverse interests can begin to be nurtured. Uh, once that harmonization has occurred at the donor level, we also expect more transparent and more accountable governments uh, that actually operate within the policy space and not the one that is being usurped by presidents and NGOs. And that everybody understands why governments should work according to its policy and its uh, uh, plans and budgets. Uh, as far as uh, implementation is concerned, I would like to see increased use of government systems for aid delivery, rather than each uh, donor agency setting up parallel implementation structures in country to deliver that aid. I also want to see true decent decentralization working. And as far as decentralization is concerned, we all believe it is the vehicle that can send us to the, 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 the development goals that we are, we are all looking at. And yet, in our own countries, it is a Ministry of Finance that is a stumbling block between true decentralization and 
uh, 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 non decentralization and that the, uh, the willingness to actually let go the resources to that decentralized level as was envisaged rather than keeping it at the central level where governments are coming to advocate where presidents can send letters and authorize uh, is one thing governments and in countries need to overcome I think the, the last thing is the, 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 the critical thing is also to begin to see more private capital flowing in in a manner that doesn't cannibalize, that actually seeks to fill a space that allows citizens to get proposed services and uh, the investors also getting some form of returns from their investments. Then we also will, I also like to see NGOs reducing the fierce competition. In fact, NGOs, the level of competition among NGOs right now is to the extent that some are willing to cannibalize each other to get resources for implementation. If we are fighting for the same goal, we don't need to go to that extent. NGOs must also put their acts together, begin to see uh, a, a common front that they, 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 can, they can play, shift away from heavy infrastructure, limit infrastructure development to only the poor areas that are deprived, and focus on the policy engagement, getting accountability, testing new ways of doing things as the gate is promoting. Uh, the innovation, because NGOs are more flexible to innovate compared to government that is operating within a very fixed framework. Uh, lastly, I would like to see communities in the cities and that we don't do things for them and that truly they are the drivers of our development and we are responding our aid to their needs and their demands. And if we can achieve this, when we come back here, we should be celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> So we can, we can look forward to a great meeting in 20 years. Yeah, it's going to be great. Now, I, I need a little bit of assistance from the audience yeah. uh, because I'm not, I'm not a big sports fan. Um, but if there's a guy down here who's looking at me going, <laughs> what, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to ask everyone to help me thank this, the panel we've got up here. I think it's been a really good discussion. Thanks everyone that stood up to speak. I would like to observe that we at the Water Institute stand four square against any form of exploitation. These four people, if they charged us commercial rates for the advice and the, uh, the insights they've shared, you can do the sums, you can work out how much it is. We respect that. And so, as compensation, we offer at least a t shirt. <laughs> Does it fit a 900 pound so, gorilla? I'll ask you to uh, give, ex express again your appreciation as we are expressing ours uh, to each of the panelists as they step off the... Uh... <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. As we start to close this final plenary, I'd like to share some thoughts about what we've been doing over the last four days. One of the themes of this panel discussion that I've particularly valued has been the focus on capacity and on learning from experience, one's own experience and the experience of others. And I guess it's only natural that I, as an associate director of the Water Institute for Teaching and Learning, am likely to look at this event in terms of what we've been learning and how we've been learning. I think everyone in the room shares some common objectives and goals, but we have a very healthy diversity of opinions and perspectives at this meeting, particularly about how best to achieve those objectives. We all share one humbling attribute. I may be wrong, but I don't think any of you claim to know exactly how to achieve the goal of better water and sanitation and hygiene for all. In fact, again, I'll go one step further. I may be wrong, but I think all of you came here to Chapel Hill with at least one common aim, and that was to learn things that would help you support progress in water sanitation and hygiene. So I think we all came here to learn things. 
And over the last few days, I've been pleased to hear from several of you that this indeed is a good meeting at which to learn. A number of reasons were offered, but I wanted to highlight three of them. The first and perhaps most obvious one that people have pointed out is the interdisciplinary mix of professionals, researchers, and students here. We have biologists, we have engineers, we have administrators, we have behavioral psychologists, we have political ecologists. That was a new term for me, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit, but now I've, I've learned about political ecology. We're all here, and we have a rare opportunity to share our perspectives and learn from each other. Many people mentioned this to me, and of course I agree. Interdisciplinary approaches are a value of the Water Institute and of the Gilling School of Global Public Health, of which we are a part. But a second aspect that people mentioned resonated particularly uh, strongly for me, and that was the range not just of disciplines, but of roles. Thank goodness this is not a conference of academics only speaking to academics, practitioners only complaining to other practitioners, philanthropists talking only to philanthropists, and government administrators, aka bureaucrats, talking only to other government administrators. Those meetings have their place. We gain a lot from them, but this conference is one of the very few places I know in the sector where all the roles come together to exchange ideas, knowledge, and experience. I worked in Mozambique from 1982 to 1984 after its war for independence turned into a struggle for survival against the sabotage of mercenaries from the apartheid regime in South Africa. Not surprisingly, in a revolutionary Marxist-Leninist state in this situation, there was a lot of political graffiti on the walls. I don't remember many of those graffiti. In fact, I don't remember any of them except for one. Let us make of our country a school where we are all teachers and where we are all learners. That really stuck with me. And one of the things I like about this conference is I see it happening. The third and final impression of why I think the group works so well uh, is best expressed from a thought that Camille Sade shared with me yesterday. And I'm paraphrasing him. I see him right here, so he'll probably correct me. I'm putting a few words in his mouth, but I, I think he'll correct me if I've got it wrong. One of the things he pointed out was that the size of this conference is just right. He said it is intimate. It's big enough that we have the best in the business to talk to, but it's small enough that we can actively engage, we can really talk to and listen to our colleagues. I agree with Camille that the scale of this event is just right to balance the range and the quality of the conversations we can have. Personally, I share the broad elements of Jamie's visions of where we want to get to in the sector, although we happily disagree about priorities and approaches. I think we both learn from each other when we do. If I don't have a job at the end of the week, you'll know. <laughs> Neither Jamie nor I claim to know the one clear true path to promote water sanitation and hygiene for the health of all. But I believe we both come out of this conference feeling invigorated and a bit wiser about the challenge, having learned from all of you. We hope you feel that way too, and we plan to continue the conversations with you after you've left Chapel Hill so that we can all continue to learn and to work more effectively to support development. That is, to support people in their efforts to take control of their own lives. Now, I've focused on the process of the last few days, but Jamie will offer some closing remarks on the content of what we've all been exploring. Jamie? Thanks, Pete. The, the, the job's secure. You're OK. Um, at the end of last year's conference, three different people came up to me and said, Jamie, why don't you, towards the end, give us a, a wrap-up, you know, draw the threads together, tell us what, what we learned from the conference. And I said, yeah, of course, great. And about two weeks ago, someone reminded me about that, and it didn't seem such a good idea after all. <laughs> so I'm on the spot to try, try and achieve that. And it's not made easier by the fact that... I'm not an engineer, people know that, but, and my math isn't that good, but I've worked out that one into four doesn't go if you're not divisible. Yeah? So I haven't been in all the streams, and I haven't listened and participated in all of the discussions. So I'm trying to draw together things that I've heard, things that are repeated in the corridors. There's certain themes that are, are coming up very strongly, and I'm trying to mingle those with all my own prejudices and biases and opinions and all of those things that scientists aren't supposed to have. So what, what do I think is coming, coming out from what's, what, what we've heard here in these few days? 
And what I think we're going to hear in the next few days, because I've tried to speak some, to some of the people that are running sessions later in the week. Well, there's one underlying thread that's often unstated, and that's the fact that the world of WASH has come a very long way in the last few decades. Jan Willem, you, I forget exactly how you worded it, but you, where are you? There you are. Um, and I, the, the gorilla wasn't you, it was the foundation. You understood that, right. didn't you? Okay, right. So, um, but you, you talked about the fact, you know, the, the, the girl that's born today is more likely, to, more likely to survive birth, more likely to get into school, more likely to go further into school, more likely to give birth successfully, and more likely to die of old age and something along the way. That was something like what you said. And WASH has contributed to that. And it's not optimal yet, but we've come a very long way in these few decades. Many more people enjoy far better WASH than was the case, let's say, back in 1990 when the MDG Enterprise is, 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 is baseline. And that's true whether we measure it in terms of access numbers or changes in disease burden, in innovations the way we, live, the way we work, CLTS, HWTS, so on whether we look at the relationships among governments, as we heard in the discussion about aid amongst in other sessions here. But that simple fact, the fact that we've come a long way, has very large implications. And first and foremost, I think it tells us we should beat ourselves up a bit less. The, the WASH world is incredibly critical of what it does. You listen to the way we have our conversations. I, I think there ought to be, we should be self-critical. We should learn and we should change, but I think there should also be a sense of pride in what has been done. And I've heard that sense of pride coming out in several of the sessions that I've, I've attended and that I've enjoyed participating in. The changes also mean that our starting point for the future is different to the one that existed when the last cycle of big plans were made. And that in turn matters because a thread that's pervaded several sessions that I've enjoyed listening into and several presentations is the idea that we do to things, we need to do things differently. We heard that from our keynote speaker, Al Hammond, on the potential impact of social enterprise. We heard it in sessions on sanitation, more responsive, responsiveness, sanitation cycle management rather than toilet counting. We heard it on the aid panel just a few moments ago. Some of us will remember that not that long ago, there was a sort of mantra or a phrase that you would hear at events like this. And essentially, it said, we know, we know what to do, we should get on and do it. And it was almost a, an anti-monitoring, anti-science, anti-reflection, anti-evaluation position. I saw two people nod as I said that, so there are others that remember those phrases. It's there's a clear sense here that that's, that's not so, that we need to learn in order to do things better and in order to, order to do things more efficiently. So this underlying theme of bringing science, insight, innovation, together with advancement, moving WASH ahead, that's something that's now a far easier conversation than it was even 10 years ago. It also strikes me that if we are to change, and clearly there is a mood for change, then we need to understand what we're trying to change into. That we, our starting point should be understand what kind of world we want to contribute to creating. That's a bit of our, our visioning. And then we need to understand how that's different to the one we live in today. The contemporary relevance as we meet here of that thinking is extremely high. We're in the middle of a cycle of thinking about the new international development targets that will replace the MDGs post-2015. I'm not sure how many people have strong views about that. It probably isn't a surprise that I have very strong views about that. I, I was trying to, to find old PowerPoints, and old PowerPoints have got this bad habit of getting lost in some bit of the electronic ether that I'm completely unable to access. But I, I think it was in the very early 2000s, not long after the MDGs were first properly articulated, that I first concluded a, a, a presentation on global wash by saying that I really couldn't conceive that the height of human ambition as we moved into the 21st century was anything less than safe, reliable water and decent sanitation in every household, 
every school, every workplace, every healthcare setting. And then a few years later, I thought, whoops, you missed something there. And I sort of snuck, snuck in the, and hygiene is practiced, to complete the story. And I still believe that today. And others have kind of coined other phrases, and there's different ways of expressing similar ideas, similar sentiments, everyone forever, ever. Some of those statements become entire essays as we weave in the words sustainable, affordable, gender focus, and so on. But there's a strong sentiment that there is a vision that we're trying to work towards. And I think we need that vision in order that we can chart our course forwards. Some would see that there's a tension between those kinds of visions, ideal targets, what we would really like our world to be like, and the practical steps that chart how we're going to get there. I don't hold that view. And we've heard here at the conference, um, as we have in the three preceding conferences here in Chapel Hill, about the value of a human rights perspective. A perspective that values both the goal, what we want to create, our destination, and what we need to do in order to, to, to arrive there. Progressive realization. We plan most effectively when we know where we want to get to. There may be more than one route. We may make course corrections along the way, but we need to start understanding our destination. And in order to chart our way to that destination, there are several things that are needed. Equity is the value that comes to us from the discipline of public health. It comes from the lens of human rights, and it comes from individual humanity. But for many years, I would argue that equity has not been a big deal in the world of WASH. And I think that's not a fashionable statement. We like to believe it has been. And yet, I think it's actually quite natural that it hasn't, because for most of history, WASH has been characterized by lack. Very large numbers of people without even the most basic levels of provision. And so, and so ensuring achievement of any level of access for as many people as possible absorbed efforts. And doing so contributed to the achievement of the situation we've inherited today. Imperfect, but very much improved. And for that reason, it seems to me that it's natural, it should be no surprise to us that equity and practical concerns about how to increase equity are part of discussions here this week. I enjoyed particularly on Monday, for example, a session that was co-convened by the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation, who were talking about practical issues in how to target unserved households as, sorry, unserved populations. And that as the, un, the, number, as the number of unserved declines, so understanding who's missing out becomes more complex. And that in those conversations, people broke down the challenges in terms of people in households. The example might be the one in six of us who are physically disabled. Households in communities who are marginalised, whether for reasons of race or religion. And also whole communities who are difficult to reach, be they uh, nomadic and, and travellers. And I think, Tessie, you spoke to that in your, your words earlier today. Or reasons, or marginalised for reasons founded, for example, in the racial history of this country. Now, over recent decades, we've seen service levels for water increase at the same time that we've extended coverage with basic access. And in several of the sessions that we, we've had here, the idea of service levels and service ladders and different qualities of, sets of service, different degrees of good have come up. And it's clear that we need to develop our vocabulary and learn how to communicate these rather complex ideas in simple ways that will resonate with policymakers, that will allow us to describe the way that we see the world in a way that communicates as simply as, for example, the, MD, the MDG simplicity has. The MDG binomial categorization, you have or you have not, has not, is not satisfying to those of us in this room because it's too simple. We know the world's much more complicated. But it's something ordinary people get, media, media writers can write stories about. Our complexity is not so easy to communicate. So we need to, to learn how to capture those ideas, whether they're in indices, graphics, but through more communication means. Now today, 
we spend far more on upgrading the services for those that already have service than we do in extending basic services to those that do not. Which at one level sounds terrible, and another level is a natural consequence of where, of where we are. More advanced services are far more costly. There are far more people that have something and want something better than have nothing. But that really matters to us because the benchmarks that we use in the world of WASH are a very, very long way from the ideal. So even as we see achievement of the, the, for example, the MDG vision, at least claimed achievement of it in the case of water, there's a lot further to go. And that matters, continuing with the example of, of water, because work that I think is scheduled to be presented this afternoon from University of Leeds, University of East Anglia and ourselves, really highlights the idea that these sort of basic levels of access, the improved source benchmark that we use, leaves a lot more to be achieved and there are substantive improvements, substantive benefits to moving towards a far higher level of access. In the case of water, a household level of access. And yet very few of us are programming towards that. And we've heard here about sanitation equivalents to that. We've, talk, we've heard about levels of sanitation or cycles of sanitation from the household through the community to large scale um, sanit sanitation benefits that uh, that contribute to well-being at a very large scale. Again, that has huge implications for planning and for capacity building that, Pete, you highlighted in your introductory words. The fact that the situation is so much improved over what it was, for example, back the situation back in 1990, means that the, the, there is a driving, that the driving need to ensure access to services is increasingly accompanied by a need to ensure that those services are not lost. And I say that, and now I feel almost guilty saying that, because we are all speaking that language in this room, sustainability and so on. This is part of the, 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 the narrative that, that we, 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 we now hear, to ensure that services are not lost. And yet, again, there is still much more to learn about that. The work of uh, water and Sanitation for Africa, presented earlier this week, points towards the conclusion that, in fact, the, the optimum number of beneficiaries for a well-run well and hand pump, the level at which functionality peaks, is far lower than is commonly targeted or is commonly achieved. Interestingly, again, the idea that science and insight contribute towards better policy and better, better programming. So the implication then is politics, policy, programs, implementation. All of these things that we believe can and should be done better require more effective governance, more effective institutions, more appropriate implementation standards, more, employment, more appropriate deployment of appropriate incentives. Now, the term governance has got a bit of a top-down feel to it. It feels like government. It's something that comes down from above. And yet, what we keep hearing is that effective governance is not what comes down from above. It's what people participate in and make happen together. And we've heard examples of that, whether from the, the stream keynote that Barbara Evans presented for us about institutions themselves, through to very specific examples of where regulation is needed and has not been effective. I have in mind work done by Tufts University on companies, international companies, selling into Haiti products that were not only ineffective in water treatment, but were also potentially unsafe for human consumption and carried false certification marks. Apparently reputable companies from well-recognized countries. Our governance systems, our regulatory systems, are part of what makes WASH work, and we need to invest in them more. We've heard at local level examples and, and quite passionate commentary about partnering with local government as a means to enhance sustainability of local interventions. We heard at national level about the work in bringing social enterprise to fruition. And if we think about international government governance, we know that Sanitation and Water for Africa, for example, is an example of a new kind of alliance that's principally driven by governments, 
but he's also giving us some of that integration that was called for from our, our panel earlier today, starting to break down some of the boundaries. Where's Fred? I'm looking the wrong way. There you are, sorry. I didn't see you for a moment. But starting to break down that silo thinking that several, of, several people have spoken about in order that we can see the benefits of, of having WASH. Tessie, you talked about it, unified with or seen in concert with education. Fred, you talked about these multiple directions in which a finance ministry has to satisfy different overlapping needs. And you talked about the, I didn't think you called it a bin, but the place where cross-cutting issues end up, which de definitely doesn't have any funding in it. The basket, that was the word we had for it. One of the things I've enjoyed a lot over these last few days is seeing just how much M&E, and M&E linked to accountability, is being talked about. M&E that's a practical exercise about improving the situation rather than simply describing it or criticising what other, other people are doing. We heard from Monday from the Hilton Foundation a whole series of events that were looking at very practical issues. How do we target the disadvantage? How do we generate a core set of indicators that would inform decision making but would also allow us, allow, allow us to reflect on the diversities of, of context in which very different projects take, take place. Recognizing specificity, but having harmonization across. And an interesting challenge to ensure that there are feedback loops from that kind of monitoring to real practical short-term action for improvement. I think one of our speakers this morning talked about the idea that many improvements are pushed downstream. They're the next cycle. Maybe in the next grant we can worry about that. We need to tighten those cycles back and see good practices implemented in immediate cycles. I remember particularly a discussion uh, around work by WSA, con oh, so the findings of a study by, by WSA, um, looking at hand pump functionality and finding not only large variations in a single setting, which implies to me that different approaches can, can yield very different levels of functionality, but a very practical series of uh, actions that would enhance levels of functionality over and above the 79, 80% that they were reporting that is already very high in terms of what is being achieved in much of sub-Saharan Africa, Africa today. Throughout all of these conferences that we've run here in Chapel Hill, this is the fourth, we've maintained a tagline that's about where science meets policy. And we did that because we wanted to make clear that, that there was a real need for science that would inform and be informed by users. And although it's science for policy, the intention has always been very clearly for policy, policy and for practice. And I think we have seen good examples of evidence that has been taken into and has informed policy change and practice change. But it strikes me that we've been much less effective in capturing the policy needs to help drive the right questions, to help drive the right science. And there's a session, I think, scheduled for Friday. Clarissa, I'm about to call on you. Friday, that's right, isn't it? Looking at, the, amongst other things, on some work that has been um, or that will touch on some work that was done in response to the information need of the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership to understand if it is now the case that WASH is meeting effectively with finance ministries, if the WASH world is now making its case alongside those other ministries that are also making demands for resources, what, what makes ministers of finance tick? How are they briefed? How do they make decisions? Because that's the kind of question that we need to answer if we want to be able to influence the, the associated outcomes. We've heard controversies as we've, been, as we've been here about science for policy. We've heard about disagreement on burden of disease, just what the level of ill health is on our planet. And it strikes me that one other thing that we've heard a great deal about is partnership. And we've heard quite critical comments that partnership isn't a good thing in its own right, but partnership's something that we do for a reason. It's something 
that we do in order to improve our, our effectiveness and our impact. And we've heard that in terms of integrating WASH within WASH-related areas. So we've heard about WASH and nutrition, WASH in healthcare, WASH maternal and child health. But also funneling outwards, we've heard a lot about WASH and poverty reduction, WASH and the, the big water agenda. Examples we, I can think of, the work of alternativas in watershed management, of CRS in Ethiopia, bringing together food security with sanitation through Arbaloos. Excuse me. It seems to me that we're in a, a period of reflection in the world of WASH, in partly because we are looking towards the closure of the MDG period, and there's a lot of discussion about the post-2015 agenda. And in partly in recognition that things have changed, and that means we, me, means we need, towards, need to be able to look towards the future differently. Reflection means that we do need to look back. Looking back is good. They say that those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat its mistakes. But we also need to look ahead. And we had some ideas from our panelists about what changes they see as essential as we do so. One very clear thread is that business as usual is not sufficient. We do need to change. We need to learn. We need to do things differently. We need to do things better. As I've been speaking, um, Clarissa has been very kindly clicking up things on the PowerPoint behind us. Uh, there were a group of us putting these together yesterday evening, and they were intended to try and capture the key nuggets of, of what I wanted to try and go through. And at the end of it, we were looking at them and said, well, they're quite a nice reminder list, but they're potentially something more. They're, they're part of a description of what's coming from many different groups and many different conversations and many different ideas about an agenda for WASH as we look forward into the 21st century rather than looking back into the 20th century which preceded it. And it's, the slide is presented as an attempt to provide that and to make us continue thinking about our common future in striving towards that world that we would all like to contribute to creating. That's my attempt, Pete, to try and, and wrap up what we have here today. Uh, my a final comment then is to wish everybody a very successful another day and a half of this conference. Enjoy, keep the conversations going. And if we need to change this agenda because we've missed something, let us know. Thank you.